Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for participating in yet another Latter Gay Stories interview, where we better understand the intersection and better understand the lived experiences of the queer community. We welcome you if you're watching this video episode from one of our video podcast players through YouTube or Facebook. We want to invite you to use that live chat feature and make some comments, um, either for myself or for the guest. If you are watching on the video version of this episode, we invite you to uh, share your comments, ask a question, use that live chat feature to also interact with other people who are watching this episode. It's kind of a cool feature that gives us an opportunity to be like-minded. Uh, it also uh, helps us to better uh, expand our reach because of connection. So that's just the interesting and uh, unique way that algorithms work on the video version of the podcast episode. And it doesn't have to be the live version. If you're catching this after the premiere, you can still use that comment and chat feature to have a real-time discussion with those who are also participating in the episode even after it's premiered. So pretty cool and we invite you to do that. If you are listening on an audio version of the podcast episode, we want to say hello to you and also to uh, ask you to subscribe to this channel. And if you are listening uh, on the Amazon side, welcome. Because of the many listens and over the years, the strong support of the Latter Gay Stories podcast, Amazon Prime has invited the Latter Gay Stories podcast into the Amazon podcast community. So if you are listening through Amazon podcast players, we, inv we welcome you and say hello. In addition to our other listeners through Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartMedia, and others, if you uh, are looking or not familiar with the whole podcast world, we invite you to listen and subscribe to this channel wherever you catch your favorite podcasts through your podcast player. And if you are looking for our older Latter Gay Stories podcast episodes, we invite you to visit our website at www.lattergaystories.org. There you can find this and other episodes as well. So again, thank you and welcome to another Latter Gay Stories podcast episode. Excited to have Jacob here in the studio and want to welcome him. Uh, welcome to the studio, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for sharing your story, Jacob. Hi, I'm happy to be here. So um, this is going to be a great episode about um, a variety of topics. There's a lot of discussion lately um, about BYU and BYU's role in the queer uh, student experience. That'll be part of our episode today. We're also going to talk about missions. We're going to talk about coming out early, um, what life looks like navigating this world. We're going to talk about sexual harassment, um, mission presidents, coming out to parents, uh, Jeff Holland, uh, Elder Holland, and uh, a musket talk. So kind of a wide variety of, of discussions we're going to talk about in this episode, which I'm super excited about. We also want to discuss what um, not only um, our discussion about BYU, but also um, what's next after BYU. And for those students who are contemplating attending the Lord's University, those who are currently involved at BYU, and those who are looking for another option. So kind of the umbrella of what we'll discuss today um, so without further ado, let's, let's get to know you, Jacob. Um, let the Latter Gay Stories audience in on who you are, uh, where did you grow up, what, what was family life like, and at what point did you realize, I'm different? Yeah, those are uh, all great questions. So I grew up in Northern California uh, in the Sacramento area in a suburb just outside of it. Um, Family life for me, while well, I was uh, raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, my parents met at BYU, and uh, my family has a long tradition of attending BYU. I have four older sisters. I'm the youngest, and I'm the only boy. And growing up, uh, there was lots of great big family dynamics. I remember spending a lot of time with my family, going on vacations and staying at home. And I think when I started to realize I was different, it was probably about age 16. Um, I actually had a crush on one of my close friends. He was in band with me. And I thought that he was gay because of some stereotypes <laughs> of, uh, that are in the queer community. And I just noticed that I really enjoyed spending time with him 
it was around the same time that I had started going on dates with girls because in the church, uh, dating starts at age 16. And I had been on some dates uh, with some of my friends that were female. And I didn't really notice a difference between going on dates and just kind of hanging out as friends. There wasn't any kind of romantic feeling that I was having when other guys would describe their crushes on girls. I didn't really understand why they felt so much pressure to impress them or anything. And then when I started to like that friend of mine, that's when I started to understand that, oh, that's what these feelings are like. Um, so I think that's that would probably be a good place to start. Oh, um, I'm interested as um, we don't receive a lot of training on how to gay date, uh, especially within Mormonism. I mean, there's, there's this taboo nature to this topic about how um, we're supposed to avoid that at all costs. I'm curious, as these feelings begin to develop, um, how do you proceed forward with them, or what do you do with those feelings? Well, I definitely describe my experience as overwhelming, for sure. Um, we didn't have young men's lessons on what to do if you don't have feelings for girls, if you're gay, or if you don't, you know, if you're asexual and you don't have, or aromantic and you don't have those feelings as part of your life experience. Um, I have a memory for sure of after the first time I held that friend's hand. Um, I remember I was going to bless the sacrament the next day and I didn't know if I was worthy because when you bless the sacrament and you're a priest, you break apart the bread and I thought to myself, oh, I held the boy's hands. Will my hands breaking this bread apart make it so that the congregation doesn't receive forgiveness for their sins? Um, so it was very uh, high pressure, I'd say. And I didn't know. There, there was no description of what's the line of what's a sin versus what is okay to do. I think in general, I was taught that being gay and doing anything that was described as homosexual behavior, as I think how it's described in the For Strength of Youth pamphlet, is wrong. So it was it was very stressful. I didn't know what to do. Let's step back just one step to uh, the moments before you held his hand. Okay. Um, had you come out to anyone else before, and how do you get to the point where you go from uh, closeted, uh, worthy of preparing the sacrament priest or teacher, um, which is these steps in the Aaronic Priesthood for Latter-day right. Saint young men. Um, at any rate, you're not out to your family. You're not out to the community. You have this connection to this boy. How do you get to the point from um, thinking, I must be gay or could be gay, to holding his hand? I think in general I'm a pretty brave person. I'm willing to take risks. Uh, I knew that he liked me just based on the attention that he was giving me and what some of his other friends had told me. And I think I wanted to see what it felt like. I wanted to see what the other people my age were experiencing. And I had those feelings for him, and so I decided to just go for it. And it was everything you hoped? It was. It was really awesome. I remember in the moment and after, um, it was a Saturday night, I was elated. I was, it was super enjoyable, it was super fun, and that's when it really clicked to me that I was for sure attracted to men. I think at that point, the jury was out on whether I was still interested in women or not. Um, but I think it, I think it was what I wanted, and it brought an understanding to my mind of what it must be like to have those feelings, those romantic feelings for someone else. Yeah, that's kind of the, as I'm listening to you uh, share that experience, um, the two dichotomies, I think, that show up. Um, you say, you use the descriptors like elated 
and happy and complete and connection. Um, and then you also talk about what it was like to stand at the sacrament table and stare at the, the same hands that just held the hands of a boy um, and having these uh, contradictory feelings, um, it seemed. Talk about that for a second. Um, you raised Latter-day Saint, um, traditional Mormon with uh, this celestial upbringing, this idea of um, do what is right, let the consequence follow. And here was a very lived, real experience of doing something that now just felt so right. How do you navigate that world as a Latter-day Saint? Well, it took a lot of time for me to figure that out. Um, one vocabulary term, I think, in the psychological world is um, cognitive dissonance, so holding two conflicting feelings at the same time. And there was definitely a lot of that. For context, I was very, very active in the church. I went to church every Sunday. I read my scriptures. I had personal scripture study. I went to seminary every day at 6 a.m. before school started. And I didn't just attend seminary. I read the standard works, so all of the canonical scriptures. Every, every year, you focused on a different area of scripture. And I also did the scripture mastery. So I was very committed. I also had a calling. I was a ward organist. So um, it wasn't like I was only partially in. I was, I was all in with the church. And it was very distressing to feel that I would have to give one of those up, either these feelings that I had for that boy or the church. Let's walk through that. I think, uh, I think you set the scene very, very well. How does one person um, either embrace both or shy one? Because I think that's, uh, that's a super familiar uh, predicament that Latter-day Saint um, men and women uh, find themselves in as they navigate this journey? Um, or uh, is it possible to maintain both? Well, we'll see later in my story that I didn't think it was possible to maintain both. And actually, at this point in my story, when I was 16 or 17, um, in high school, essentially, I chose the church over my romantic feelings. I uh, Kind of how it ended with that boy was he wanted to date, to you know, be official, be boyfriends. And one of my sisters was getting married in the temple in a few months. And I was afraid of the consequences of not feeling worthy to even be around the temple um, during her marriage and feeling that shame that exists when you don't feel like you are living up to the standards of the church exactly as they have been taught to you. So at that time, I decided that the church was more important in my life, that that was what I was committed to. So you said um, 16 to 17 years old. Uh, as you're navigating this journey, at some point you have to bring your family into this. Um, ty typically when we when we discuss situations like this, it's usually that the weight, um, that that burden um, of shame, as you brought up, usually becomes too much to bear, and you have to start bringing other people in. Uh, your parents, at what point did you have to have that conversation with them, or feel it was necessary to have that conversation? My first memory of telling my parents, maybe not outright, was actually I read a talk by Jeffrey R. Holland called by Behold Thy Mother, where he talks about a young Latter-day Saint man who uh, is gay or was gay and who receives support from his mother in that, I think he describes it as a trial, which I don't really like that wording in his life. And I mentioned to my mom kind of passingly that I might be attracted to guys and she was supportive for sure. Um, she kind of told me that she loved me and that was it, which was really great. Um, 
I will say though that before I came out to my parents, I had really great friends and the parents of friends who were very supportive of my identity. And after I'd come out to my friends and felt comfortable and known that some of my other queer friends were accepted by their parents, it was very easy to come out to those parents and know that I would be supported and and loved by them. I think at this point, um, we maybe just derailed just a second to talk about culture because you aren't living in Utah, uh, which seems to have a completely uh, different set of traditional standards or cultural expectations uh, surrounding this topic and Mormonism. Um, let's, I just want, I'm just curious uh, what, what life was like um, in California, in a California ward, um, knowing that we're post Prop 8, that generally, um, Topics of sexual orientation and gender identity are handled in a much different perspective um, outside of Utah than they would be, uh, particularly here in California, where you were being raised. Was that your case? Uh, what was the general uh, feeling regarding gay people um, in your family life and in your uh, church and social circles? I think in my family life, there was some differing opinions within my own um, immediate family. I think my sisters, for the most part, from what I knew, were extremely accepting, um, maybe even outspoken allies in the best way. And it was more of a pro-same-sex marriage and um, LGBTQ rights and things like that. My parents were a little bit more neutral um maybe the best way to phrase it is let other people live their life and don't worry about it don't necessarily go out of your way to defend people but don't care too much about something that doesn't affect you and as far as my community went i actually grew up in a pretty conservative community in california el dorado county is where I grew up. Um, there's been a Republican Re House of Representatives member for many, many years there. But I found myself surrounded by younger people, people who are my age. So uh, Gen Z, our generation, tends to be very accepting of queer identities. And I found that a lot of my friends were more on the liberal side and their parents were as well. So my immediate community was very accepting, but maybe the community on average would have been more pro Prop 8 when that was going on. As you navigate, um, here you had the opportunity to hold the hand of a boy. Was that it until uh, your mission or were there other instances where you continue to pursue uh, those feelings that you had before, and um, I guess in tandem, what was dating life like the remainder of your high school year? So junior year was when I first held hands with a boy, and then I had some other crushes on some guys, and the feeling was mutual sometimes and not quite there other times. I, I actually only had crushes on other guys who I knew were um, gay or bisexual. So I'd never had the stereotypical straight guy crush that a lot of gay guys talk about. Um, I did have, this is kind of scandalous. I did have like a secret boyfriend at the, towards the end of my senior year as I was preparing to go to BYU. Um, and I did kiss him more than once for sure. So I did uh, taste the forbidden fruit, so to say, before my mission. <laughs> so, yeah. And it was desirous? Yes, it was very desirable. I, I like that you still have a smirk. Yeah. To me, that's amazing. <laughs> so for those of you who are listening on the audio version, you're missing something pretty, I, I think something pretty authentic and something quite telling of, of an experience 
uh, for someone who um, is tasting authenticity and honesty uh, for the second or third time. Yeah, I think by then I really was feeling that that was right and that was okay. I think by that time I didn't think that there was anything wrong with being gay. So you uh, prefaced that with saying that this was in preparation or prior to um, you uh, attending BYU. Yeah, so this is where the timeline gets interesting. I originally was planning on attending BYU before serving a mission for a year or two years. Just that's what my thoughts were. I think I wasn't exactly sure if I wanted to go on a mission. My mind changed. It's hard to look back and understand exactly why that happened then. I think I was very bought into the idea of of a mission and I had a lot of friends going and I didn't think it would be bad to go on a mission. Uh, and I eventually, I was studying scriptures and reading in the Book of Mormon about when I think Alma and his brothers go on their missions. And I thought, well, I think this is the right thing for me is to go on a mission before I go to BYU. And so I decided to defer my enrollment. And that actually ties really well into the story of me coming out to my parents. If you want me to. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Yeah. So I went to my parents and I told them hey, I want to go on a mission before I go to BYU. And they were a little bit confused that I had seemingly like abruptly made this different choice because a mission is a huge commitment. It's two years of your life. Um, you have to really be prepared for all the things that are happening. You get endowed before you go on your mission. You go through a very um, a high commitment ceremony in the church and specifically in the temple in the temple yes specifically in the temple and i was telling them about how i wanted to go on a mission and they were very incredulous as to why i had changed my mind and so i uh, told them that i was worried about going to byu that if i went i wouldn't go on a mission that i'd be kind of too sucked into the world, um, which is funny because BYU isn't exactly known as being super worldly. It's, you know, the Lord's school, as they say. And I told them that one of my main worries was that I would go to BYU and potentially fall in love and I wouldn't know what to do with that, with the honor code. And if I, since I am only really attracted to men, I was very concerned and I remember there was kind of like a moment of silence just for a minute not awkward just kind of them taking it in I don't know if my mom forgot about the other conversation that we had um, but I mostly remember my dad talking I was for sure crying a lot at this point because I was I had been so nervous that they'd find out or that someone else would tell them that it was pretty nerve wracking to tell them both at the same time in the same room because I wasn't exactly sure how they'd react. And I remember my dad was, he was very calm and very loving. And he said, you don't have to go on a mission and you don't have to go to BYU. You don't even have to be, member, be a member of the church if that's not where you think your life is going to take you. And my mom was a little bit quiet. Um, my mom is a very, very devoted member of the church. She's been a Relief Society president, a seminary teacher. She takes her commitment to the church very seriously. And my dad is a lot more nuanced. He's a lot more um, scientific in his thought processes. I think he acknowledges that there are other options outside of living in the church that are great options for life. So at the time, I was slightly offended that he'd suggest to me that I could live outside the church because I didn't really see another way. I didn't think that there was necessarily anything wrong with being gay. I just didn't think that that was what God's plan for me was. Um, 
well, I knew that I was gay. I didn't think his plan was for me to go and marry a man or live the gay lifestyle or anything like that. So I was pretty adamant that I wanted to serve a mission. And so a few months later, I did. What was that like in the uh, interview process? So for those who are unfamiliar, part of the uh, mission process is meeting with your bishop and your stake president and uh, discussing levels of worthiness. Um, did you feel worthy to serve a mission? Did you feel obligated to discuss some of your uh, sexuality and sexual experiences that you had prior to those interviews? I was very close with my bishop my senior year, and I told him that I was attracted to men, um, and he said that wasn't something to worry about, that that didn't really affect my worthiness to serve a mission. And I also spoke to my stake president, who had actually previously been a mission president several years before, and he had known other youth in the stake and missionaries who were also were also gay. And so he didn't see it as a problem either for me serving a mission, which may be a unique experience to me. I'm sure that there are other bishops and stake presidents that don't take quite as kindly to that. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that that's honest. Uh, so you, you get your mission call. Elder Lambert, you are hereby called to serve in the... The McAllen, Texas mission. So I served in South Texas. I was called to uh, serve Spanish speaking. My mission was very unique because it is the only mission in the United States where everyone is called Spanish speaking. You sometimes serve in an English ward for a certain amount of time, but actually the majority of the units in my mission were primarily Spanish speaking. Let's talk about mission life. Um, I have not yet met a missionary who um, ultimately will confess that when you step off of the airplane and into the mission field, all of the, all the feelings um, go away and that you are straight as an arrow and uh, wise and all-knowing and uh, un unashamed of who and what you are. Was that your experience as well? What was mission life like, uh, especially living full-time with other men? Yeah, you get a little treat of what the gay life is going to be like in the future <laughs> in some ways. Um, yeah, important mission experiences. I think we'll start with my trainer. Um, my mission trainer was super awesome. He was a great guy. I remember, I don't remember the exact order of events here, so I'll just say it in one order and whether one thing happened first or the other, then it's not, who knows? I don't remember exactly. I do remember coming out to my trainer though. Uh, I told him that I experienced same-sex attraction is how I phrased it at the time. And he was very kind. He was very uh, understanding. And he did tell me, though, he said, that's not something that bothers me, being your companion, but you just want to be careful which missionaries you tell that to because not all of them will be as accepting as I am. And I think that was probably the best that that could have gone. I don't think he could have reacted in a way that would have made me feel better about it in any way. I think he was wise in some ways to tell me to be wary of who I tell. I think there's issues with missionaries gossiping about each other, and I didn't want to be known as just like the gay companion. Um, so that was... That was one experience at the beginning of my mission. The other experience I had at the beginning of my mission was I had one of my first interviews with my mission president and I was talking to him and he asked me if there were any sins that I hadn't confessed to my church leaders before I left. And I think I had been feeling a little bit of guilt or dishonesty about not telling my bishop or stake president about how I'd kissed a boy before I left and so I told him that and the process that I had to go through after telling him that was much much more than I anticipated um, I actually I don't I don't blame my mission president for 
anything that he did. I think he was just following church protocol. But I actually had to call my stake president back at home and confess to him that I had kissed a boy. And then I also had to go into my mission president's office at another point, and I had to fill out a form that was about my sexual history, which wasn't really sexual at that point. I mean, I don't think just holding hands or kissing is really like sexual history, in my opinion. Um, And I had to fill out like what age my partners were. So basically anyone who I had a crush on, how, how much older or younger they were than me. And it was always within a year. So nothing too out of the ordinary for uh, a teenager. And that was really weird to me that I had to divulge all that information in order to be able to like determine whether I was worthy to stay out in the mission fields. I'm curious what that does to your psyche. What does that, what does that do to, cause we've already discussed a lot about um, these levels of shame and guilt. Um, does that pile more shame um, onto the topic? Uh, did that create any animosity between you and your mission president? I think my mission president was very kind and he was hoping that I'd stay in the field. He told me, I don't think this will affect whether you stay out in the field. I think you'll be fine based on what I had told him. I was worried though, even though he tried to comfort me and say that it wasn't something that I need to worry about too much. I was worried that I had made a huge mistake by even trying to go out on a mission, being knowing that I was gay and I, it was, it was very stressful. I, I didn't know if I was going to be sent home early and if that was going to affect how I was viewed in my community or by my family members, because there's a lot of shame. If you, if you return home early from your mission and there's not a medical reason for it, there's a lot of shame that you basically that you sinned or did something really pretty stupid out on your mission. And I was, I was worried about that. Luckily that is not what happened. Um, I did end up staying out in the field and there weren't really further repercussions. I didn't really hear back anything other than you're staying on your mission. And did that come from the church headquarters where they informed you by letter or was that just something your mission president had received and during a mission interview, just let you know that you're good to go elder. Uh, My mission president just let me know that I was good to go. I didn't see the letter from church headquarters, but I had to send something in, so I assumed that something else was received back to be able to know. You also served um, in the height of COVID, which um, for many uh, Latter-day Saint missionaries, that was a very trying um, experience, mainly because so much of your work was done online in your apartment and not in traditional ways that missionaries work. How did that impact your mental health and how did that impact your journey forward? Well, COVID hit at the very end of my mission, so it actually made my mission shorter. Um, Any missionary who was being released on or before September 1st, 2020 was to be released, I think, two transfers early, so 12 weeks early. So I was actually released June 10th, I think is the day I came back from my mission, instead of in September, which allowed me to attend fall semester at BYU. As far as what it was like to do missionary work during COVID. I remember we did some online lessons through Zoom with some people uh, and that was that was fine. We couldn't go into members' houses for dinner anymore. So that was different, but some members would still package things for us as long as their family wasn't sick and they'd leave it out on their doorstep for us to have dinner that night. The uh, other part that I did not enjoy so much was trying to communicate with people on Facebook. I actually avoided that as much as I possibly could. I tried to mostly communicate with members and people we, re- we had already been teaching. It, is, it, it felt really weird to me to trying to put, approach strangers online just to talk about the church uh, or to call people in the area book old phone numbers that we had. It felt like becoming a telemarketer for the church instead of someone who was trying to bring the gospel to other people, it felt very strange and I did not 
enjoy that part of it at all. <laughs> and that seems to, I mean, there's still some lingering um, uh, proselyting techniques that still exist in today's uh, Facebook marketplace with uh, Mormon missionaries. We still see that where they are marketing uh, goods and services, <laughs> the Book of Mormon, a copy of the Book of Mormon, a uh, Bible lesson or service through the classified ad section of Facebook, um, which I still think is, uh, I don't know, a tad bit cringy. And even it, it, it's, it's uh, affirming to hear another missionary who was involved in that also see it being a little tacky and cringy as well from your perspective. Well, it felt really disingenuous, like messaging people. One of the strategies they said was join groups of things that you're interested in. So like cars or video games or Legos or whatever, and try and message those people and try and get an interaction with them through that thing that you're, that you're both interested in and then mention that you're a missionary. So that, that seemed really strange to me to pretend like you're there for another reason, just trying to become friends with someone. And then really your real motive was, Hey, do you want to get baptized? Kind of. Yeah. And for me, I was on my mission when you were born, uh, which dates me. Um, but we didn't have come follow me. We didn't have, we had the original six discussions, but our uh, missionary training manual had a very similar, uh, type of approach, but it was called BRT or build relationships of trust. So we didn't, uh, I mean, Facebook existed when I served a mission, I think. Um, but we didn't have these opportunities to join uh, different groups. Our methods of building relationships of trust were done face to face, trying to find um, common commonalities and and uh, units of strength or or uh, of likeness, and then proceed forward with the gospel message. So I, I really think, as I mean, it's kind of the uh, similar theme. But I do agree with you. This seems so, just something about it seems cringy to me. Yeah, I think the thing with building relationships of trust in person is you can really be there for the person and actually create good relationships with the people that you're teaching, whether whether they get baptized or not. But there's almost a... this. Ha I don't want to relate it to online dating, but I guess that's where it's going, where you can like ghost people if if you can tell they're not interested or if you're not interested in them anymore. And I think that adds an extra layer of awkwardness is just blocking someone or immediately not responding as soon as you know they're not interested. And I guess in person, you'd do a similar thing on your mission where you just stop teaching them. But there were definitely people I would stop teaching on my mission that I'd see around and I'd still say hi to them and be kind to them. But yeah, it just, there's just something so like, not being forward with your intentions online where things are supposed to be interactive for a purpose is very strange to me. And I, like I said, I avoided that kind of proselyting as much as I could in the last 12 weeks of my mission. I want, uh, before we move away from your mission, I want to talk about uh, something we brought up in the introduction of this episode. And that was uh, some sexual harassment that you experienced uh, while serving as a missionary. Let's talk about that. And, and what was that experience like? Yeah, uh, this might be a little bit difficult for me to talk about, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm not going to name the mission companion that sexually harassed me, but I will tell the story. Um, I had a mission companion. And for almost all of my mission, I was actually a zone leader, which is just you are you and your companion work together to be in charge of missionaries in a certain area. Usually it's, for my mission, it was about the size of a stake, um, which was about one city and a couple outlying areas. And this was close towards the end of my mission, but before COVID happened. And I had a missionary who was my companion and he, obviously I've already said that, but, um, he started making a lot of remarks about how he thought I was interested in him physically and sexually. And at first, I thought it was a little bit funny just because I was 
so shocked to hear a missionary companion say that because when you're on your mission, your whole life is devoted to like serving God and doing your best to teach other people the gospel that you believe in. Um, most missionaries believe very devoutly in. And to hear someone make sexual jokes was very shocking and I, d I didn't really know what to do. And so he continually would I uh, would make those comments about me wanting him physically, being attracted to him. Uh, he did some other things that were weird. Like when I was driving, he like would grab my thigh sometimes and there wasn't really anything I could do because I was driving and I didn't want to crash the car. Um, and there were some points where I thought, oh, maybe if I make a joke back, it'll get him to stop. And that did not work. He just got worse. And then every week with your companion, you have something called companionship inventory where you talk about any kind of conflict that is in your companionship, whether it's anything ranging from, hey, during this lesson, that was not the right way to teach this, or can you do the dishes, things like that. But I, I had... I talked to him sev several weeks in a row during companionship inventory. Hey, you need to stop making these sexual jokes about me. It makes me really uncomfortable. I really don't like it. I need you to stop. And he kind of put the blame on me. He's, he was like, well, there were some times where you also made jokes. And I said, okay, well, then we both need to stop. I need this to not be a thing. It's, it's really distracting me and making it very uncomfortable for me. And he, he wouldn't stop. And so... Eventually, I sent an email to my mission president. I probably should have texted or called him so I'd get a more immediate response looking back. But I sent him my weekly letter, which when you're on a mission, you send your mission president a letter every week uh, through email. And I said, hey, I've been having this problem with my companion where he says a lot of sexual things to me constantly. And I've I've tried to get him to stop and he just will not do it he just he just won't stop and my mission president texted us the day after and said kind of cryptically said hey i'd like to come to church with you this sunday and give you both an interview and my companion said something like oh i wonder why he's coming down and i didn't want to tell him that i knew why he was why our mission president was visiting us but i definitely knew it was about that email that i had sent him and when my mission president did come to handle the situation, he took us both into, he came to, he attended sacrament meeting with us the first hour of church. And then he had, gave us both private interviews and my companion went first. He was in there for a very long time. Uh, and then my mission president invited me into the room and we, we switched spots. And the first thing he asked me was if I was okay, if there was anything that I needed and I said I wasn't doing very well um, and that it had been really hard because I didn't really know what to do to get my companion to stop making all these sexual comments about me and like touching me inappropriately um, and he uh, I this was my second mission president so the earlier story was my first mission president and this is my second mission president my second mission president my very first interview with him, I told him that I was gay and that that hadn't been a problem with any of my companions or on my mission at all. And that if it, that if it w was a problem for any reason that I'd let him know. And that's exactly what I did. And he thanked, he thanked me for letting him know that the issue was going on. And he asked if I needed what's called an emergency transfer, which is where you immediately switch companions so you pack up all your stuff and you go to a different area and you're with a different companion and I was concerned that if I did that that my companion would gossip about me and people would find out that I was gay and that or come to that conclusion um, and I was I was super worried about that so I said I don't know if I should leave stay in this kind of bad situation with my companion or if I should stay so that kind of to save face almost. And he said the decision was up to me, but he did say he was also worried that 
it would look like if I didn't want people to know that I was gay, that switching companions would potentially cause people to kind of find out. And so I did decide to stay with that companion. It was just one more week um, until transfers. So it had been, the harassment had been going on for several weeks and um, he told me that he had told my companion that if he, that if the mission president heard anything else, that that was kind of it for my companion, like he'd be sent home. Um, so he, he gave him a warning. And so I felt like I had trust in my mission president that he had done a good enough job talking to my companion that it wouldn't be a problem. And so I decided to, so I decided to stay and my mission president gave me a priesthood blessing to kind of comfort me and bless me that I'd be able to be able to, you know, uh, do okay the rest of the transfer. And as we drove home after church, my mission companion was driving and he said it was it, we didn't talk to each other for several minutes on the way home and then he said do you want to know what he asked me and I said sure and he said well he asked me if I was gay and he was very offended that the mission president had asked him that and apparently our mission president said it's okay if you are you just can't sexually harass people essentially which makes sense um Sexual harassment is terrible, uh, criminal even. And he uh, had told my companion that he had purposefully given him companions that were good leaders that he trusted so that he could become a better missionary. And he was really disappointed that this is what was happening. And so the rest of that transfer, there was some animosity between us, but he kind of just would go with whatever I thought was the right thing to do that day or um, because he had been scolded and told that he was in the wrong, which I think he really was. So, Yeah, good on that, uh, your second mission president, for recognizing, uh, understanding where there could be some trouble and also advocating for you. I, I think that's admirable, and that's an example of, of a member doing the right thing. Yeah, I... Uh, I think both my mission presidents are, are great people and also um, their wives who played a very big role in the mission. Um, I usually call them mission presidents because they're, they kind of serve as together to do a lot of the work there. And yeah, I, I really think my pr mission president did the right thing. I'm not sure how it would have gone if I had never reached out to him and asked him for help. Do you think you were the only gay missionary in your mission, or were there others that were out? Uh, because the trend of having um, open and out gay missionaries serving uh, is relatively new for Mormonism. There have always been, clearly, um, gay missionaries who serve. Right. Uh, hello. Um, me right. and many others. But the, the trend of having an open and out uh, gay missionary serving is something that we've really just seen in the last five or six years. Um, and so just curious if there were any other missionaries in your mission uh, that were out uh, and what their experience was like, if any. So uh, there are not missionaries that I knew of at the time that were out who were gay. Um, but I, since I have come out on Instagram publicly, there have been some uh, missionaries that I served with that reached out to me and told me that they have they really admired that I came out and they came out to me when through their message so at the time I didn't know and I thought there's no way I'm the only one that's just statistically improbable that out of you know 200 to 300 missionaries somewhere in that range um, that I would be the only gay one that just seemed really unlikely but I also didn't try to speculate about other missionary sexualities. Um, that just really wasn't what I was, I wasn't focused on, you know, like flirting with any of them or anything while I was out. So, yeah. Let's walk through the next chapter. You um, 
technically we're an early release missionary, which then um, does bring some uh, questions from ward members. But given, I think, the circumstance of COVID and um, what was happening there, you probably got a little bit of a cultural pass. Yeah, there was, I think there was a first presidency statement about missionaries being released early who had a certain release date and people knew that that applied to me. And so no one gave me any grief for coming home early. I served 21 months, so it was a long time to serve a mission. I, yeah, so I came home from my mission in June and I did some kind of odd jobs that summer um, because of, it was summer of 2020. Yeah, 2020. And so COVID was kind of in full throttle at that point. Uh, masks were required pretty much everywhere. I think most of what I did was like yard work. So I was members of the ward or other people who I knew in the community. I would just go out and they'd kind of tell me like, hey, can you do this or that? You know, mow their lawn. I helped build a fence. I um, did several other things that summer. And then... I started BYU that fall. I think the semester started in August. I BYU Provo? BYU Provo, yes. So the OG BYU, the one here in Utah. Um, and I lived in Heritage Halls, which is on-campus housing at BYU. It is, you just walk to campus if you live there. I didn't have a car, so that was the most convenient uh, place for me to live at that time. And I just had some random roommates, people I didn't know at all. Uh, there were six of us total in that apartment. And my room roommate, so the one that I actually shared a room with, he had also just gotten home from his mission like a month before. I think he had gotten home in July. And my whole apartment was RMs. The other four uh, people in my apartment, they were all high school friends, so they already they already knew each other, but they were super inclusive of us and like would invite us to things and to hang out with us. Um, but I had a interesting experience with those roommates where uh, all but my roommate, the one who was in my room, they were all from Utah. And so that comes with some interesting things <laughs> uh, just culturally so one thing is that they kind of got in the habit of using the f slur uh, i am i allowed to say it i mean i i have a pass so i can say it but can i say it on the podcast so that people know yeah so it's the word faggot um and they use that as sort of like just like a passing not used towards people who identify as gay but just as like a like, you're being stupid. And some of them use, like, gay as the word stupid. Like, oh, that's so gay. Like, why would that happen uh, if they were upset about something? So that year I was, um, it was kind of hard to live in that environment at times. It wasn't super often that they'd say that, but it was often enough that I heard it and I remembered it. And I did end up, towards the end of the year, I came out to a few of them as a way of saying, hey, can you not use that language around me or at all? And they actually were, all the ones that I came out to were super kind about it, and it, they stopped using that kind of language when I told them, so. And hold on just a second. I'm going to fix your mic. Oh, okay. There we go. Can you slide it? Just grab the whole stand and move it just a little bit. There you go. Like there? Yep, perfect. Okay, great. So as you're chastising them a little bit, rebuking in times of uh, necessity. With love, with of love, course. Did, uh, did they actually respond well, and did that really end it? Yeah. Yeah, they... Um, they all, all the ones who I told actually apologized to me and said, 
I had no idea. I'm really sorry that I was using that language and I won't do it again. And they didn't after that. So that was a good experience. Um, it was kind of scary to tell them because I didn't, I didn't know how they'd react. So I just, I figured that we were already friends and they were nice people and that if everything went well, that they'd, they'd stop saying those things. Uh, so for the last few months that we lived together, it was a lot better. Um, kind of going back in time though, uh, to talk about other challenges at BYU, I, as I went home from my mission, at the end of your mission, you uh, do like a training. I can't remember what it's called, but it's your, it's your last six to 12 weeks. You take a training course on adjusting home for missionary life. And they really encourage you to go out and date so that you can get married in the temple and have an eternal family and all those things. And so I decided that I'd maybe try to go on some dates with women and just see how it went. I, uh, Spoiler alert, they did not go very well. They were not super enjoyable. Well, I don't want to say they weren't enjoyable because I did have a good time hanging out with those girls as friends and we did have fun on the date, but there was no romantic feeling or spark that came from any of the dates. I don't think I ever went on a second date with any girls. It just, I mean, why why go on a second date if you don't feel like it's going to go anywhere? Um some other things were my freshman year, I came out to all of my sisters, uh, and they were extremely loving. Um, they are all super great people. Some of them are in the church and some of them are out of the church, but they all were and have been super great allies to me since I've come out to them, which is not the case for all people. Some people have really difficult relationships with their family when they come out to them. I want to get to the point in uh, your BYU experience where we roll into August of 2021. And that is uh, Elder Holland I'm meeting together with faculty and staff and giving the musket talk. All right. So June of 2021, I came out on Instagram. Uh, I decided it was time to let everyone in on that. And in August of 2021, as you said, there was the infamous musket fire talk by Jeffrey R. Holland. Uh, and in that talk, which I kept hearing about uh, because people knew I was gay, and so they kept asking my opinion about it when I hadn't even, I didn't really know anything about it. Uh, so in the talk, there were a few things that were less than ideal, things that I for sure dislike that Elder Holland uh mentioned, which one of them was that he was very dedicated and wanted the staff to be de dedicated to the unique academic mission of BYU, which is to raise people in righteousness, basically, to uh, have them have a testimony by the time they leave BYU, which that's not always how it works. Uh, and he uh, referenced Elder Oaks talking about wanting some more musket fire to defend the traditional family. And I uh, was not a fan, to say the least. I was pretty shocked that his PR team let him say that, you know, that they wouldn't think that that would be something that would be wrong to say, uh, even as an analogy with there being there is violence against queer people um, all over the world. And I mean, even recently there was a, a, a shooting at a gay bar um, recently in present day, not in August, 2021. But I actually was that part, obviously I was not super pleased with, but the part that actually bothered me more was when Jeffrey Holland talked about his tears that, that him and the other members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the First Presidency have shed for their LGBTQ members. Um, while he looked emotional in the talk, and I'm sure that they have had real feelings where it's been difficult for a difficult topic for them to tackle, 
it's nowhere near the amount of pain and suffering that the queer community has suffered. And I felt very annoyed that if he really was empathetic towards that, um, the struggle of being queer in a world that is homophobic and transphobic, if he really felt empathy and wanted things to change, then there would be some pretty big changes in how people were treated in the church. And it felt very fake to me, very disingenuous. And it made me question whether or not the apostolic authority was a real thing. If that was something that even mattered, or it, it made me feel like I, I didn't feel that that talk was inspired of God. And that was kind of what led to uh, my shelf breaking, so to speak. Uh, I, I, some people would phrase it as lost my testimony, but I would say I found my true beliefs that year as I questioned the authority that the church claims to have and that it had over me personally. What do you, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a lot to, to take on. So that's a lot to unpackage. Um, you have honorably served this church. You have given it two years, nearly two years of your life uh, in voluntary service. Um, to borrow temple terms, you had given the church uh, your, all of your time, your talents, and energy. How do you just abandon it um, so completely? So... It wasn't a sudden abandonment. It was gradual. I had been feeling like there wasn't exactly a place for me in the church for years. But I think when Elder Holland made that call to push back against civil rights, essentially, at BYU, um, specifically for the queer community, that made me feel like there just wasn't a place for me there. And... At the end of my freshman year at BYU, I had decided that I'd go for another year and that if I didn't really feel like BYU was the place for me, I would find an alternative for schooling. I'd transfer somewhere or take a break for a year and then go somewhere or do something so I wouldn't have to be in that environment anymore. And it's interesting to me that there weren't really any secrets about church history that I didn't know. I was very well informed. I had studied church history in seminary. I had studied it on my mission. I'd studied it at BYU. And it wasn't something that I I wasn't really allowed to be bothered by it in that environment. But once I was able to allow myself to question whether I truly believed the reasonings that were given for all sorts of issues that people might take with the church. Once I was able to not just listen to whatever the church's reasoning or excuse was, it was actually very freeing to be able to think for myself. Uh, I'm a very logical and scientific person. I love, I love science. I love hearing about new discoveries and the verifiability that it has to be like peer reviewed and all those things I think is really cool. And the lack of that in church teachings, the the amount of "Hey, just just trust me" is uh, made me very skeptical of whether or not any of it was uh, whether I believed any of it was true. And so, in some ways, thanks Jeff Holland for helping me realize that um, and understand things. And that year, I actually listened to a lot of Latter Gay Stories podcast of different people who had. Um, gone either way, who had stayed in the church or who had decided that a different life was the best life for them. And that year I decided that it would be better for me um, and my mental health as someone who became a non-believer in the church to transfer out of BYU. And where did you go? What uh, we, we know what led to the transfer, um, but was it what you expected? And did you find what you were looking for? Well, my oldest sister used to work at BYU as an academic advisor, and now she works with academic advising at Utah Valley University, which is in Orem, Utah, just about 10 minutes from BYU. 
And so I asked her about what the transfer process would be like. And she gave me resources that I needed. And I put in my transfer application at the end of the year in 2021. And I did one more semester at BYU. And uh, in fall of 2022, I started at Utah Valley University. And I'm a proud Wolverine now. Go Bulldogs. Go Bulldogs. <laughs> uh, exciting. Um, and uh, overall acceptance at UVU. Were you... Um, met at that intersection of sexuality and reality where your sexuality was questioned uh, like it was at BYU? Were you able to let your guard down um, as a Wolverine um, at UVU as opposed to hiding uh, who and what you are at BYU uh, when you were at BYU? It was a world of difference. It is, it's so different and it's even, in, it's in the same conservative Utah County as BYU is, but the culture is just so different because there's no arbitrary rules that the church has assigned to BYU. There's, there's nothing like that at UVU. Um, what really comes to mind is my philosophy class that I took last semester. There were some opinions that I shared about, especially about religion and philosophy of religion I, at, at this point in my journey, I would say I'm atheist. Uh, and if I had ever mentioned that at BYU, there could have been huge problems with uh, being able to be enrolled at BYU. But at UVU, they, they don't care what your religious affiliation is. They don't, um, they don't, you know, take points off or kick you out of the university for that. It has also been amazing to know that there is actually a resource center specifically for LGBT students. I haven't um, been super involved in that uh, because I've, I've felt safe at UVU. Um, people are very accepting. My roommates all know that I'm gay. I came out to them within the first day of knowing them, and it's been great. Yeah, now I have a pride flag in my room. I, I don't feel concerned wearing rainbow things on campus or anything like that and it's it's been great i want to play devil's advocate for just a moment uh, because there will be some latter-day saint um, listeners to this podcast episode who said but jacob you just didn't try hard enough um, you if you would have just done x y and z or a b and c differently you could have made it at byu but you failed you just you didn't hold tight to the iron rod as expected. Hmm. That's a good question. For my personal situation, I didn't want to be at BYU anymore, so I kind of don't care um, about that reasoning necessarily. But I will speak for the many queer friends that I have that are still attending BYU that you don't know them well enough to know their reasons for staying um, or for leaving. And if you take the time to ask them about their journey without deciding to shame them for being different or having different beliefs than you, then I think you'll learn a lot from that experience. Um, a lot of students who, I think there's, there's kind of two advocacies. There's, you didn't try hard enough, you could have stayed. And why are you still there? Why don't you just leave? And I think there's just so many reasons that are like, financial or family reasons that you'd stay at BYU or leave. And I think you, you really don't know unless you really know someone's story and you can ask them if you feel like it's appropriate, but it's, it's their choice whether they tell you or not. And I think, you know, the church teaches love one another and, I don't really think being so judgmental or not giving an effort to understand someone else's situation, which is different from yours, doesn't really scream out love one another to me. Yeah, and I've had uh, many interactions with BYU students, queer BYU students who are still there. And, and one thing that you brought up that I think is important is you said it's their choice. And I also want to add on top of that and say it's also their church. Uh, sometimes the straight community will say, 
uh, the straight Latter-day Saint community will say, you have to abide by our rules. Uh, this is how we see things. But to the queer Latter-day Saint, Mormonism is their foundation and their root, too. Uh, they are part of that church as well. It's as much uh, the queer Latter-day Saints church as it is the straight Latter-day Saints church. And so uh, we, there's clearly um, some issues here that will need to be weeded out among the membership of the church. But um, this us versus them mentality at some point uh, becomes increasingly unsu unsustainable. And, and we see the, the division between the two groups uh, continue to increase based on uh, ownership of the, the rights, the rules, the policy, and the tradition. And uh, personally, I, I want to see people thrive in their circumstance. And if thriving meant uh, leaving BYU and going to UVU, um, I think you and others who have done that should be celebrated. Um, I, I think it would be one of the basic tenets of the Articles of Faith to allow us to worship how, where, when um, we needed to. Um, that, I mean, religion aside, we have those rights and we have those uh, obligations to be happy and to, to see that our choices uh, benefit us. Yeah, I think the church in BYU could be a very welcoming place if we, if those who were um, still active in it, especially the straight Latter-day Saints, um, if they did their best to be welcoming and to, to invite other people. I mean, on the, on the signs of the church, it says visitors welcome. And my question for a lot of people is how welcome are they really welcome? Um, if they're, pretty significantly different than you. And I think there's a lot of work to be done to make that a more welcoming place. And I think there are there are people who are really trying to do that. And I give kudos to those people for making those efforts because the systemic change that will really need to occur to make everyone feel comfortable is enormous. Um, but doing your best in your community in your ward, in your in your stake, in your con you know, your relief society, your elders quorum, et cetera. Doing that work um, and doing the best you can is really admirable for those people that are making an effort. I want to talk about one of the best parts of the podcast always, and that's uh, the look toward the future. Um, and what's what's life like today? Um, Tell, tell us what you see down the road, and um, are you happier on this side of the aisle? Yes, I am happier, <laughs> is my first answer. Um, well, I think I've been able to enjoy some uh, some of my dating life. I, I'm still, you know, like looking for the one, you know. Uh, I think eventually I will want to get married and be able to, you know, have have a life partner and... I uh, be able to have that awesome experience that I think the majority of people desire as part of their life. I uh, want to graduate, <laughs> of course, uh, and I think I will. I think uh, transferring delayed my graduation by about a year, but that's okay with me. I'll still be in my 20s, you know, a young spring chicken, as they say. Uh, yeah, looking forward I, uh, one thing that I really want to do is be able to give back to the queer community as much as I can, uh, to find those organizations like, uh, USGA at BYU was an organization that was super helpful to me to be able to find community and find friends. And I want to plan my life out to a point where I can give, uh, my time, talents and money <laughs> to the organizations that help queer students and will help move forward the agenda of LGBTQ people, which the gay agenda is just to be, just to live a happy life, to love and be loved and to be treated as equals amongst our peers. I love it. I, I, and I, I love that you're not alone in this process that you've been able to prove uh, through your own experiences that you're not broken and that uh, the future means that your very best days are ahead. 
And I, I think those are all beautiful things to own. Yeah, I'm excited to see where life takes me. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to bring up uh, in this episode that you wanted the audience to know? Uh, I actually had a cool experience with that second mission president after my mission where after I came out, uh, his wife saw my post on Instagram and he reached out to me and said, hey, I want to know how I can better serve members of the LGBTQ plus community um, as a as a church leader while still, you know, following the commandments and we actually did like a, we had a FaceTime call where I talked to him about um, kind of some ideas of how you can best address missionaries. You know, if, if he knows that a missionary is gay, how to, how to address that and how to um, help them best. And I think that was an example of younger church leaders who are trying their best to make positive change within the community. I the other thing I'll say is um, just I would really encourage you to be supportive of those that you know that those who come out to you or those who you know identify within the community to express your love for them because oftentimes silence of of from you, from your experience, um, from my experience, I don't, I never knew how someone would react or I never knew, um, whether someone would still love me unless they explicit, explicitly told me that and said, Hey, I don't just love you because you're my brother or because we're friends. Like I love you. I love all of you. I love that you're gay and I love that part of you. And I think too often we don't express exactly how much we love people. And I think especially acknowledging someone's identity and that you love that part of them, um, that you honestly feel that way about them is really important. And so I'd encourage you to tell people that. I think it's beautiful. And I think that's, uh, that's a great bookend to this episode because I, it gives uh, everybody the opportunity to aspire higher and find a goal to um, be better in or out of Mormonism. Yeah, I think good things can be done wherever you're at. I love it. Jacob, thank you. Thank you for giving us uh, an hour of your time to share more of your story, to allow the audience. I often um, talk about these coming out experiences, not as coming out experiences, but letting in experiences. So thank you for letting the audience in and uh, allowing us to get to know you a little bit better and to also give us the ability to support you and uh, lift you up and, uh, again, to borrow another religious term, to sucker you, uh, to run to you uh, when you need it, and to also support you. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and for the good things that you are doing for this community. Thanks. I have loved being here. And thank you to the audience who have participated in this, another Latter-day Stories episode. If you have a question for Jacob, want to ask him something specifically or comment about uh, something in this episode, and you are watching on the video version uh, through Facebook or YouTube, we invite you to use the comment feature or um, the live chat feature to ask that question. And we will um, make sure Jacob will participate online as well. Uh, yes, he says he will. So for those of you um, who do have a question for him specifically, uh, share it. If you are listening on the audio version, uh, we also invite you to um, participate in our live chat uh, through Facebook. Uh, we also post this episode on Instagram so we can have a conversation um, wherever uh, your social media um, outlets take you. So uh, for that, we're thankful. Again, if you um, have a question for myself or Jacob or the podcast in general, feel free to shoot that along. We'll be happy to have that discussion. 
We want to thank you for joining us on another hour of Latter-day Stories. You can catch this episode and others online at latterdaystories.org. We would love it if you would help uh, share and um, distribute episodes like this. It does help us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. Your simple uh, share or comment on episodes like this does us a world of good uh, in uh, the way the algorithm distributes uh, content like this. So again, thank you. Thank you for all you do as a listener, subscriber, and supporter of the Latter-day Stories podcast. It's stories like yours, it's stories like mine, and stories like Jacob's that help us each to continue writing our own Latter-day Story.